Equality, equity. What's the difference? It's been said that equality is making sure that everyone has a pair of shoes, but that equity is ensuring that people have a pair of shoes that fit them. As we talk about the difference in the commonalities between these two concepts, we'll talk with K-12 educators, university professors, and we'll also talk with community activists around how they help to build equity in our educational systems. Colleges and universities should be places where all students are able to learn, thrive, and grow. And that they do that in an environment that provides them exactly what they need. My guests in this next segment will really explore how they've been able to use an equity lens to demonstrate for students their ability to have school success and lifelong opportunities. Welcome to Beyond the Rhetoric 3, Equity in Education. On my, uh, on my left is Sean Dickers, and Dr. Dickers, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization, and we'll continue around the table. Sure, so you named me, so I'm Dr. Sean Dickers, and I'm the department chair at Bethel University, uh, which has a teacher education program of about 300 students, a little under 300 students, and we graduate you know, 90 to 100 a year that are going out into the schools and teaching. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Dr. Keith Brooks, and I've uh, done a lot of work in K-12 schools, specifically around equity work and cultural competence, as well as higher ed, being a professor in teacher education programs, and also as an administrator as a dean. So I'm glad to be here today. Hi, I'm uh, Donald Eubanks. I'm an assistant professor and current uh, field director in the School of Social Work at Metropolitan State University. I'm Sue Hammersmith. I'm the retired president of Metropolitan State University. And um, I've spent my entire career in higher education, mostly in administrative roles, working in Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and then at Metropolitan State to uh, promote racial justice in education. Great, great. So as you may have noticed, um, our program will be broken into two parts. First, we'll be addressing uh, higher education. So what does equity look like or sound like in higher education? And later in our program, we'll talk about what that looks like in K-12 education. So my, uh, my first question, and uh, anyone can, can answer th this question, how, or how does one define or, or what is this idea of equity? So, so, so what is equity? How have you come to understand equity? Uh, what is equity? I'd be happy to start off. Um, it's lots of different pieces. One, it's filling in what was lost and taken, specifically from people of color. Um, it's also not necessarily looking at equal or the same. Um, and when it comes to students, it's about giving each student what they need. Uh, sometimes we hear many people say, hey, I treat all my students the same. Well, that's not what we're looking at. That doesn't even work for me as a parent. <laughs> you know, each child or each student and each, per each person uh, is different. So it's looking at root causes, uh, basically, of how we got into the conditions that we're in and addressing those accordingly in terms of removing barriers and boundaries. All right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up also. Um, equity is not a statistic. Okay. And too often we say, oh, the graduation rates are this, or the standardized uh, test scores are that. And the, those measures, while you can learn some things from them, they oversimplify reality way too much. And equity is recognizing the entire range of diversity within our various populations. And the fact that some, at higher education, some of our students are uh, full-time, some are part-time, some are traditionally, you start the fall after you graduate from high school, you go full time, you're supposed to get out in four years. Other students come with different life experiences and they're 42 years old and they're coming back, they have kids, a family, and they're going, if they graduate in six more years, that's a success. 
I want, I'm going to come back to some of the points you just gave because that, that just sounds like that sounds like life, right? Like that's yeah. just that's just life. So, um, Don, how, how have you come to understand, or how do you talk about that this idea of equity in in your classes or in? Well, in uh, like I said, I, I teach in the school of social work. So in social work, we tend to look at equity and equality more kind of in a social justice realm, which I don't think uh, differs tremendously from education. Mm -hmm. But in social justice, when we talk about equity, we're talking about um, having situations where, where individuals have barriers removed that allow or have this idea that given one similar situation with another, those things would be equal. Um, whereas equality is, and it all is wrapped around this idea of social justice, fairness, everyone having kind of an equal opportunity to achieve, to uh, uh, prosper, to have barriers removed um, in their lives that may impact their opportunities in this country around education or jobs or housing or other areas. So equality would, would, would mean having situations where folks um, have opportunities to achieve those. Equity, however, is something different in meaning that it's more of a situation where um, given one situation over another, they're both the same. You know, I resonate, Dr. Brooks, with what you said, and you know, I think with teacher education, our, our perspective, there's this idea of equity. I, I think of it in terms of a literacy or a competency. So we have an actual class called educational equity, but what we're trying to look at right now as a program is that's not enough. It's not just about recognizing something. It's about thinking that there are systems, identifying when there's injustices in those systems, and trying to tackle those things. So we're really trying to train, te train teachers not to just take another generation of teachers and have the same system 20 years from now that we do today, which means that today's graduates need to be, they need to be literate in these areas. So regardless of where they're coming from, they have to be leaders in a system where they're gonna be agents of change. And how to do that, I think, is one of the great challenges for teacher education today. Is it's not about just preparing for your classroom. It's about being a teacher that exists in a system and talking about what does teacher leadership look like? What does systemic thinking look like? How do you address and especially take action on injustice? You can't just sit and not do anything. So I like what you said, you know, where you're talking about it's not just an idea of giving everyone a fair opportunity. I don't want that for my own kids. Right. I want to know my own children and I want to be able to act differently with each child based on what they need. So this has to do with listening. You know, yeah. And I agree with you 100% because what you just said, I think was the, uh, probably the driving force of why I agreed to come to Metro and learn how to teach. Because I was a practitioner. I worked in the field addressing these same issues my entire life. Um, the School of Social Work at Metropolitan State University was started by two women back in the 90s with that very same thing in mind. So if, if I look at the history of social work, social work in and of itself is a profession built on this idea of social justice. Mm -hmm. But even when we look at social work and we look at, we look at who we accredit to being the uh, grandmother of social work is a woman named Jane Adams who helped immigrant families, and we won't, hopefully we won't get off too much, but she helped immigrant families who were experiencing extreme uh, barriers in accessing the American dream. Now, however, having said that, she's, because she's credited with starting a place called Hull House. While she worked with immigrants, she wouldn't work with people of color. So even in social work, so we at Metropolitan State strive to do the same thing with the students who come to our program. And we do that by weaving in our regular social work um, curriculum a couple of classes we call comparative racial and, and ethnic analysis. And with the same idea in mind that, for instance, here in Minnesota, uh, 
where I'm Native American, I'm biracial, but I'm Native American and African American. Um, as a Native American, we make up, what, 1.2 percent of the total population, but in out-of-home placement, we make up 25 to 26 percent. Similar type percentages for African Americans, slightly larger population, but the result is the same, and it's usually individuals in the profession that I come from that helped cause those disparities. So our attempt in terms of equity is how do we train our social workers to be aware of those additional forces that are in place um, in this country that help us understand those differences and why you and I can walk into the same environment and come out with two totally different ideas of what needs to happen. And I think that that's what we're trying to address. You know, it, it sounds like you're also saying that when you get disparities, the disparities are a product of the system. Mm. And when we get disparities in educational outcomes, the disparities themselves are often a product of the system. And That's a good point. I'm consistent in saying every system produces the results it was originally designed to mm -hmm. create. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a, a broken system or a dysfunctional system um, in, in that regard. And, and you all make me think of a few things because uh, I talk consistently about the myth of meritocracy. Um, that's what equity work is. Um, in in, in uh, basic terms, we don't necessarily just get what we work for. There are many factors that are at play. Mm -hmm. Uh, social capital, social network, you know, upbringing, space, region, opportunity, access, all those different elements uh, uh, play a huge part. But I, 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 I hear this thing, I, I keep hearing social justice, I keep hearing, uh, I, I just heard this idea of meritocracy, that we don't get what we earn, but, but isn't this kind of like liberal belly aching? I mean, to, 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 to be quite honest, isn't the individual responsible for creating their own life, playing the cards that they're dealt, doing the best they can with what they have. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of blaming in... Andre, let's talk about the cards we're dealt. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, let's talk about the cards we're dealt. One of the things that has produced such great inequities in America is the fact that for hundreds of years, our federal, state, and local governments have been dealing different cards to different people. If you go back just less than a hundred years, the um, dur at, coming out of the Great Depression, we had the, the Social Security Act, mm -hmm. a great safety net. The legislation was written specifically to exclude three quarters of the employed African Americans and even more of the Latinos, because they defined farm work and domestic work out, it wasn't covered. Uh, if you look at the GI Bill, okay, if you look at the uh, housing, the FDA, um, uh, or Federal Housing Administration program, that during the 40s and 50s helped so many families get ahead, get educated, buy houses, start businesses. Those programs spent almost $50 billion helping upward mobility and actualization for Americans. 98% of it went to white men. The million or so African American uh, veterans, for example, from World War II, the way the legislation was written, they were systematically turned down for the GI benefits. And so the, the dealing of the cards has been so systematically unequal over the years that the, the cards I have have very little to do with me and my merit. They have a whole lot more to do with my, my grandparents, the economy, where we lived, et cetera. My cards were not the same as your cards, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Et my cetera. dad was a World War II vet and could not access the GI Bill. And if he was able to access the GI Bill, because of the Federal Housing Authority had policy in place that stated that, um, that of course, they never cited the, the studies, but that stated essentially that if homes were sold to Negroes, 
that the adjacent property values would decrease. So that's what it stated. And that was federal policy. Federal. And federal so it government. was interpreted then that when real estate agents sold homes, and because you know you have to remember the time frame. This is the end of World War II. The vets are returning. They need jobs. Um, there weren't enough. Uh, they couldn't move back to the slums and to the tenements that they were. They had left many in, in large metropolitan areas. And if you look, that was the creation of the suburbs. And those bills allowed that to happen. But it did so in such a manner that we now have this inequitable wealth distribution between people of color, particularly African Americans and white Americans, just in home ownership, you know, that is eight times less for for uh, people of color than it is for white Americans. Right, and, and in the Twin Cities, we have some of the widest racial disparities in the yeah. country, right? Education, employment, home ownership, law enforcement, policing, and health. And that's not by accident, that's strategic, that's by design, that's, that's purposeful. In some ways, it's just on cruise control from the history. And I find that many people are very selective about what kind of history they want to talk about. And, you know, I'm very specific about saying, hey, I look at triumph and tragedy. There were many positives from history, but then there's also tragedy. It's like, I can't dismiss either or. I have to look at both. And, and when I do professional development workshops or facilities, facilitate this conversation, usually my white brothers and sisters go straight to blame, shame, and guilt. And I tell them, hey, you know, that's a, a consistent pattern of a response, but I always encourage them not to stay there, you know, because those emotions don't have value in this context when it's time to, to move forward with the dialogue. And in regards to individualism, our country has done a very uh, good job of elevating an individual narrative without looking at the collective, right? I, none None of us have gotten to where we are by ourselves. All right, there's 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 community uh, in, in many aspects, and so I, I really uh, push back in that regard and talking about yes, there's individual, but there's also collective, and also many of our white brothers and sisters will say, hey, I don't work hard, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. And it's like no, nobody's saying you didn't work hard. Nobody's saying you don't have talents and gifts and skills and abilities. I'm saying you don't have the same hurdles as many people of color or underrepresented populations of these things that have been put in place over hundreds of years. But I find that many folks don't have an accurate understanding. Of, of our history. You know, one scholar said to be educated in America is to be educated into ignorance uh -huh. because there's so much collective amnesia mm -hmm. and setting aside of the true history mm -hmm. of America and of the peoples in America and their contributions. Well, but isn't, isn't, isn't education supposed to be this great equalizer? isn't participating, particularly in the United States, we have a public education system, we have a private education system, we have uh, a subset of the public education system being the charter system, where, where people can send their kids to, you know, it, it, you know uh, we don't necessarily have a, a voucher system or, or, or whatnot uh, yet, but people have the ability to, to choose where they want to send their, their kids. Isn't, isn't education, I mean, Dr. Dickers, can you, can you speak to that. Isn't education the great equalizer? I think it, well, like Keith said, there's victories and there's tragedies. I think initially the idea of public education was a great American idea. Everyone should get a free education. But when they first put it in place, it wasn't everyone. It was everyone we can think of. And there were certain people outside of that group. So, hmm. you know, initially public education, I think, was you know, I would look at it historically as we were fighting with Prussian mm -hmm. government systems to create a factory society. Mm -hmm. We needed people to not live on the farm, so you're only thinking of people that own land, but we needed those kids to not work on that farm and come work in these factories. Mm -hmm. So even in Massachusetts, they went to houses at gunpoint and pulled kids out of homes when they passed public school law. That parents didn't have an option initially with that law of where they would send their kid. So it's been a you have factions in America that will move back and forth. You know, the idea of women being educated is something that I think America has led the way in, in equal rights for women. So all of this is part of our journey, but the journey is not over yet. And I think that's sometimes when we, if we're in the here and now and we're dealing with our students, they think this story's done. Well, everyone has opportunity right now. So if you go back too far, but I don't know that that's the 
case because there's still leadership that needs to happen in these areas. When, then, when you look at the numbers, you don't see mm -hmm. that you have the number of teachers in the profession representing the number of students in the profession from all of these different demographic groups. Mm -hmm. Something's not working. Yeah. And I think part of the American history is to solve those problems and exactly. figure those exactly. things out. Because I think that it depends on how education was used. So education was used as a means to an end when it came to indigenous populations, American Indians in this country, and it was used as a tool to speed up assimilation. Mm -hmm. So the idea of educating and, and how do you break a culture down and have that culture assimilate into the dominant culture, because at that time, while we were considered savage, you know, it, 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 you know, if you look at the relationships between American Indians and, and uh, Europeans when they came here, it has evolved from one where we were considered, well, we weren't that bad, we just needed to be saved. Uh, but then when, uh, you know, uh, folks worked off their servitude and now we're free, um, what do we do with them? Well, we need to give them land. Well, who had the land? Uh, my ancestors did. So then the story began to change about us. But I'm, I'm just sharing that. So all that wasn't working once they relegated us to reservations and took the land, put us on reservations. They still had this Indian problem. And the way to solve it is to educate the children and break down the culture. And so our children, much like what you were mentioning in Massachusetts, were forcibly removed, sent to boarding schools for the sole purpose of breaking down the culture and Americanizing them and speeding up that assimilation process. So it depends on what education was used for. If I was to use a personal experience, I went to public schools in Minneapolis and I was fortunate enough to attend a private school in St. Paul at McAllister. And in my freshman year, I signed up for a, a early American history class. Um, so I, it was first week of class, we're studying some uh, community called Oneida, so a utopian community that was being put together by some early settlers here in, on the East Coast. And I think the second day class I asked one simple question. I said, how can we study this time period and not talk about the Indians that this country belonged to? And the instructor looked at me and she said, we study history from the perspective of those who conquered not those who were vanquished. And if you want to learn about early American history, you have to take that class. Yeah. Well, of course, in 1973, McAllister didn't offer that class, mm -hmm. all right? So to me, that talks a lot about it. You know, we talk about education, and we talk about perspective. And in this country, <laughs> those two don't always line up for everyone that this country represents. I'm glad you brought that up because it's hard to have a conversation about equity without talking about curriculum, cultural competence, and the lack of educators of color. And so I'd like to share something briefly and, and, and get some more feedback from, from you all. Um, because when I think about what was it, 1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation and then the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau, you see the, um, uh, you see the beginning of uh, historically black colleges and universities which have uh, trained a numerous of uh, specifically Af African Americans um, over a long period of time and um, uh, you also see uh, 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson all the way up to 1964 Civil Rights Acts and so 1954 with the Supreme Court uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall, obviously he wasn't the Supreme Court just at the time, but Thurgood Marshall, arguing the case um, of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, the racial desegregation of schools, um, and the all deliberate speed result, uh, prior to 1954, there was over 80,000 African American teachers. Afterwards, uh, by about 11 years afterwards, is about uh, less than half of that. And so I don't use these terms, but this is the, the, the common language of uh, our white brothers and sisters during this time. Hey, you niggas want integration? That's fine, but it's going to be on our terms. Closing the black schools, taking some of the principals from these schools and making them janitors at some of the white schools or putting them in district leadership or out of the sight of the black kids so that they can't see themselves in leadership. I mean, that's a very diabolical thing to do. And, 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 and so when you, when you see this transition, that generation told my generation, don't go into education. And many other fields opened up 
uh, you know, business, medicine, and different things where many people of color uh, went into. So th this, is, this is very deep, and, and not many individuals understand the, this, this history about where our educators of color uh, have gone. And I think it's a shame that my sons have not had an educator of color yet. Um, and, and I'm concerned about that uh, because uh, not that an educator of color automatically would do well with a kid of color, but there's identification, uh, there's perhaps an understanding of the narrative, there's perhaps a, a connection that could be made because I also have to work uh, hard at building rapport and trust with students uh, from all backgrounds as well. So again, cultural competence, um, and then looking at where the educators of color are and the teaching um, uh, profession, and then the curriculum. And yes, and, and I'm glad that there's an educational equity course at Bethel because at many colleges and universities across the country, there's maybe one class or no class at all. Right. But the goal is to not have that class, but that the information would be spread out through the whole program as opposed to just one class. We had a neat moment in my ed psych class when we were talking about differentiation, the brain, its formation, how it works, that each kid is ultimately so unique you have to listen. Mm -hmm. And there has to be this context of listening to your students. And I had one student go, this is just like Andre's ed equity class. Like you're teaching the same thing. And that idea that, that having the ed equity class, and there shouldn't it, be anything wrong it's that, just right? not enough. Right. There has to, it's, it's almost like mm -hmm. literacy and technology and, and just knowing this idea that your students are essentially different. I mean, it seems like a revolutionary idea that you can't mm -hmm. teach one lesson to all your students and expect like mm -hmm. results. Right. It doesn't make any sense. Right. Even at a scientific level, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So just that having that sense where mm -hmm. equity is part of all of what we do in teacher ed. You know, you brought up something which maybe is shifting the gears a little bit, but that idea that you do get, well, we have a smaller number of teachers of color in the field, Part of that is the burden that gets put on them. So when we talk with graduates where they're a teacher of color in the school, they're on every committee. They have to represent entire groups of people when really what they're trying to do is get through their first three years of teaching. And so not only are we having smaller percentages there, and there's history behind that, yeah. but when they're there, suddenly they have, to, they, they have this burden of representation where they can't just be a teacher mm -hmm. and learn how to be a good teacher in the classroom, where they are having to serve different students with different needs. That's a good and that's an amazing task for yeah. anybody to do. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems almost unfair that suddenly we, we do that to teachers mm -hmm. of color in and, our systems. And not just teachers of color. Often, I think we extend that same thing down to students, okay? And because if I just relate my journey through higher education, um, we, as students, when you're in the classroom and we're dealing with these topical t type of issues, regardless of what discipline you go in, right. um, you often are the only in that classroom and you often continue to play that same role. And so students struggle, right? Because I know an, th on the undergrad level, I got my undergrad from Metropolitan State in social work, and I played that role in that program. When I went to grad school, I made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to play that role. And it lasted about two weeks. And, <laughs> and, and some of the inequities in place in, in the education system, I, I just couldn't remain silent. When I saw many teachable moments that happened in the structure in the system that went totally unnoticed by my colleagues, my fellow students, and by, even by my instructors, that you know, I think oftentimes we are, we are accused of being too sensitive. Or, but yet, it, it's not a question of being sensitive. It's, it's, it's like that awakening. Yeah, I was born in the middle of the 50s. I'm a middle of the baby boom. And, um, and I was heavily impacted by our educational system, media, and all the other messages I got so that somewhere along the line, five, six, seven years old, I began to realize that I wasn't Leave It to Beaver. Up to that point, I thought I was Leave It to Beaver just like every other red-blooded American child that's born in this country. And what was the difference? You know, the difference was I slowly began to realize that when John Wayne shot his gun and three of us fell off our horse, I was the one falling off that horse. And that realization, I mean, and, and, and see, it's that realization for people of color in this country 
where what you're learning in your classroom isn't lining up with the reality of your life. You know, when they told us that the Constitution has the phrase that all men are created equal, but the very men who wrote that owned my ancestors, that doesn't align. So, so are you, so from this conversation, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, in this conversation, so, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that there's, because if we look at, uh, you mentioned disparities, right? If we look at uh, numbers and percentages of, uh, of success factors, it, it appears to be that, that minorities, uh, so-called minorities, uh, black folks, Native American folks, are always at the bottom or negatively overly represented or um, in all of those things. And so what you're suggesting is that there's nothing wrong with them as, as people, but that there's, there's a system in place impacting their performance. Instead of talking about an achievement gap, I think we need to talk about an opportunity gap. The system is designed to serve people like me. It's not designed, the system that was designed for the Native Americans was, was designed to kill Native culture. They'd take kids out of the home at five, six years of age, keep them 12 months a year so that they couldn't go back and have summers with their families, teach them uh, minimal academics, use them as workhorses. The uh, mortality rates in the boarding schools were higher than the mortality rates in the Nazi concentration camps. And this is all documented, but, but it was designed to kill a culture. The, uh, school system designed for the African Americans was designed to produce a manual working caste to get the minimal amount of literacy you need, but it was not until well, well, well into the 1900s that they really began to to soar and have the quality that was needed. And when they did, the results were fantastic. I can tell you one of my experiences as a dean of arts and sciences. I was, we were having a faculty meeting, 150 faculty, and I said, I think we need to pay attention to the HBCUs. They're doing something right. We at the state universities need to look at what they're doing because they H don't have HCBU the is, oh, uh, eight, historically black colleges and okay. universities because they produce graduates who then go on and become the biochemists and the surgeons and the PhDs. And one by one, every single African-American faculty member in the room stood up and told me where they went as an undergraduate, it was an HBCU. Then they went on to Big Ten universities or major research universities for the PhDs. Yeah. I said, what was the difference? They said, you have four years free where you don't have to deal with racism and where they don't give you, where they expect you to succeed mm -hmm. and they don't give you the freedom to fail. That, that's yeah, such a good point, because I, I, I'm an HBCU grad, so I went to Xavier of Louisiana mm -hmm. down in New Orleans, and uh, they wanted me. It was a space where I was welcome. Uh, they didn't baby me, they pushed me, they challenged me. Uh, you know, they got in my face, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, but it's because they saw greatness in me. And so many of our kids of color do not have that same experience in predominantly white spaces, but then also many professionals of color don't have those experiences in predominantly white spaces. It's got to be high mm -hmm. expectations, mm -hmm. high expectations. Right, it, but with those expectations, there has to, to, to be an environment and a climate and a, and a demeanor and an interaction uh, uh, that reinforces uh, th those expectations. And so that's why I would really encourage uh, uh, the viewers and, and perhaps another time to, to, to really talk about identity development and racial identity development. Joe Feagan has done some great work around whiteness and white identity development and to, to understand those pieces uh, uh, as well as, as Tim Wise. So no, there's nothing wrong with people because there's nothing wrong with any people group. It's the it, it's similar to white savior films, you know, look, looking up. There's this paradigm, there's this formula of how many uh, of our white brothers and sisters or mainstream uh, brothers and sisters only look at people of color in a way of, hey, I only want to interact or deal with you or I can only see you as helping you.
but I can't ever see you as teaching me or leading me or, or, or assisting me. And so that's a, a that's an old paradigm and mindset that has to be addressed. And, and, and again, nobody's saying these are bad people. It's just a, a mentality that's it's almost in our, in our bones, so to speak. Whew. You guys have given me tons to to really think about and, and, and chew on. So, so how do we make this stuff actionable other than just having a class, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, again, I've heard Bethel has this particular class. Um, th th there are certainly student organizations. What, what separates mm -hmm. having these classes from, you know, trying to have a, um, how, do, how can this stuff unite us? How does, how does equity, talking about equity, unite us um, in, in an educational setting as opposed to continually separating us? Very briefly, I don't, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but one, one thing I wanted to, to say is study success. That, that's, the, that's the easiest thing to do. What is working? And that's why I brought up HBCUs. Study what works. It, and, and to me, in many regards, it's not that complicated. I think many people make it complicated because they look at the negative data as opposed to looking at schools and spaces and educators that are effective with all populations and with the populations that we struggle with the most. And so with me, as a black male who did 15 years of college uh, with a PhD, why not look at some of the common themes of, uh, that have worked for me and other individuals that I have relationships with. So I just at least wanted to add that yeah. to the conversation. I like that. At Metropolitan State University, for example, when I was president, we did not have a difference in our graduation rates mm -hmm. between, even though I think it was harder, a lot of the students of color had more challenges. They were graduating at the same rates. It's a very individualized, engaged environment. Mm -hmm. And we know what, what works, but we could have a whole program on that. Maybe we will. Yeah. Maybe we will. <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you, Metro State's done a wonderful job. I mean, they serve a community, and they and they have for years. And I think that you're still learning, and there's still things there, too. But, uh, you know, for our perspective, we just found out at Bethel that 20% of our student population is now students of color in Arden Hills. And so that, I like what you said, there has to be some actionable things here. So, and from a, you know, as a Christian institution, we come from this perspective of, of justice. God calls us to seek out injustice and fight it because that injustice is not something that God created or put into our world. And that's part of the worldview of our institution. And to say that this is a Democrat, Republican kind of question, we have to get past that. This is about having a community of people where we're training teachers and educators to train the next generation. Mm -hmm. Every people group, this isn't, every people group has teachers in it. So when you're talking about how we eliminated African American teachers through, through policy change, mm -hmm. that's criminal, mm -hmm. that's unjust. And we have to at some level reach out to middle schoolers, high schoolers, the next half of your show, and, and inspire the idea that education's a worthy calling. And like no other time in history, education's a worthy calling. And we need teachers that are in classrooms so that we never have a student go through the program that doesn't see mm -hmm. someone that they can look up to and say, that's mm -hmm. me in that, in that role. So it's essential that we start solving these problems next. And that's, I think, where we're at as an institution is we're trying to find what works, listen to it, and change quickly to, right. to, to serve our students. I also mm -hmm. think white people need to take some responsibility for taking a deep dive and learn about systematic racism. Mm -hmm. America was built as a country built on white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And we have to take responsibility to confront that and learn. I am so mad at you guys for dropping these huge bombs right at the end of the program. <laughs> like, you know, white supremacy, social justice, uh, uh, really battling those things. And so uh, I, I, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us uh, in this limited time that we had. We know that your life work continues these conversations, and I appreciate that. And at some point, we'd love to have you back for, for more conversations on, uh, on these topics. Um, but for now, my name is Andre Cohen. This is Beyond the Rhetoric 2, Equity in Education, Part 1. Um, we'll see you right after, uh, after the break. So Fair cause the same, fair cause the same. Ah.